Hi, I'm Nupra Kataria, Specialist Periodontist at Melbourne Periocare and welcome to Perio Post. It's a video show which actually helps you keep abreast with the updates in Perio field. So the topic for today is vocation involvement, its causes and contributing factors. Before I go ahead, let me tell you, I see this particular problem a lot in our cases. So what exactly is vocation involvement? Before we find out what is vocation involvement, we need to know what is vocation itself. Now that's an anatomic area of a multi-rooted tooth where the roots diverge. And vocation involvement is the invasion of that bifurcation and trifurcation area of the multi-rooted teeth, usually by periodontal disease. How common is it? Well, can I tell you it's very, very common. There are multiple studies which have been done to look at the frequency of vocation involvement in upper and lower molar teeth. Studies have shown that up to 40 to 50% of upper molars and up to 30 to 35% of lower molars are involved in the vocation zone. And the fact is that vocation involvement is always a very big challenge to treat. Before we go ahead with what causes it and what are the contributing factors, it's important to understand how are we classifying vocation involvement. Now, back in 1953, Blackman and his co-workers, they actually gave the first ever classification of vocation involvement. And uh, it was graded from grade one to grade four, with grade four being the most severe one. So in grade one, it was an incipient lesion. Um, it was suprabonic pockets and actually in the radiographs you couldn't really see it. Grade 2 was obviously more involved. It was like a cul-de-sac um, defect and um, the radiographic um, evidence was present in most of the cases. Grade 3 was a step further. And here the bone had completely been lost from the doma furca. So it was almost a through and through um, bone loss. And grade four was the same as grade three, but there was also a soft tissue recession. So the gum, gums had receded, creating the tunnel. And then came Ham's classification in 1975. He classified it according to the horizontal bone loss. So there was class one where the bone loss was less than three millimeters or equal to three millimeters. Class two was where the bone loss was more than three millimeters, but wasn't through and through. And class three was a through and through bone loss. Tano and Fletcher in 1984, they gave a slightly different classification. What they did was they took into account the vertical bone loss from the roof of vocation, epically, along with the grade one, two, and three of Glickman classification. So subclass A was basically vertical bone loss from the roof of the vocation up to three millimeters. Subclass B was from four to six and subclass C was seven millimeter or greater vertical bone loss from the roof of vocation. How is this important and why are we talking about different classifications? Well, they have a strong bearing on how we are going to treat it and they have a strong bearing on the prognosis of the teeth. Now, for example, subclass A is obviously a happier tooth than a subclass C. So a grade two subclass A has a better prognosis than say a grade two subclass C. But if we look at grade three subclass A and grade two subclass C, although it's a grade three, it still has a better prognosis than grade two subclass A, which has got a lesser vertical bone loss. So that is where classification helps us. Okay, having understood the various classifications, and there are many more, I have just actually just told you three for the sake of simplification. And this is one of the most common ones that I use in my practice, so that's why I've been talking about it. Let's go further to the causes and contributing factors of vocation involvement. There are four basic causes of vocation involvement. There's a plaque associated origin, there is an endodontic origin, there is an occlusal origin, and then of course there's a combination of these three. The plaque associated origin is one of the most common cause of 
propagation movement. It's caused by subgingival plaque accumulation. It's quite progressive. It can cause loss of attachment in bone. And generally, there's a deep probing pocket dip and bleeding on probing, which is associated with this issue. The endodontic origin actually is the second biggest reason of furcation involvement. It's usually caused because there are accessory canals present in furcation area, and sometimes it's because of the perforations that are caused during root canal treatment. So it's a bit of a misadventure there. What actually happens is that the purple necrotic products can spread through accessory canals into the interradicular zone, causing loss of bone. The peripical area may or may not be involved. The third biggest reason is that of trauma from occlusion. It causes vascular changes, resulting in periodontal ligament space remodeling and bone demineralization. Generally, we can see the changes in the radiographs in the form of radial sensing, but many times there is no pocket depth associated with it. Tooth mobility can be seen in these cases. The fourth big reason is a combined endoperio problem. Usually the endodontic treatment should be started first. And if there is a resolution of the problem, then we know that we can actually continue with the periodontal treatment and uh, it should go well. However, the prognosis of such cases really depends upon the periodontal bone loss and attachment loss. So if the periodontal prognosis is poor, the tooth actually might have a really bad prognosis. Having talked about the causative agents, let's talk about the contributing anatomic factors. There is cervical enamel projections, which are seen in about 82% of moiety with vocation involvement. There is a short root trunk length or a long root trunk length. There's a root length and root form, which has a lot bearing on uh, furcation involvement. And then there is furcation anatomy as such. So that morphology would include the width of furcation entrance, the root concavities that you can actually find in the furcation area, the bifurcation ridges, which act as, act as site of plaque accumulation. They all have a bearing on the furcation involvement. Let's take an example of the degree of separations between the roots of the teeth. So if the degree of separation between the roots is very, very large, so if you have a divergent root, it's, they are much easier to treat. Other than the anatomic factors, let's talk about some other contributing factors. Smoking is a major risk factor for periodontal disease and tooth loss, and that's quite well known. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that furcation involvement is more frequent in smokers than in non-smokers. And it's very, very common to have a case where people have smoked about a packet or two a day and they have got a lot of furcation involved molars. Other problems that are contributing to furcation involvement are the crowns of the proximal restorations. In certain studies, it's been noted that about 50% of teeth which have furcation involvement also have crowns or proximal restorations that have encroached in the area. So the take home message for today is the etiology of furcation involvement is varied. The smoking history needs to be updated and patients encouraged to quit smoking. And number three, we need to be mindful of all the causative and contributing factors during periodontal examination. Thank you for listening today. And we will be back with you again with the next edition of Perio Post. If you have any queries regarding what I've talked today, you're more than welcome to actually send us your queries through uh, emailing us on www.perriopost.com. And um, we'll see you soon. Till then, keep smiling. Mm -hmm.